This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome listeners around the world who are joining us on the Internet today. Thank you for being with us again. My guest this hour was once one of the most recognizable and also the most demonized whistleblowers in the world. In light of current news regarding warrantless surveillance, IRS overreach, and misinformation regarding Benghazi, Linda Tripp has agreed to set aside her self-imposed ban on speaking to the press to join me on today's program. And regardless of what you think you may know about Tripp, I promise you that during the next hour, you're going to hear a few things about how the West Wing of the White House operates that you will not hear anywhere else. But before Tripp joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. Linda Tripp was born in Jersey City, New Jersey. She served as an Army Intelligence Secretary at Fort Meade prior to being transferred to the Pentagon in 1987 and later becoming an assistant to Delta Force. Like many young people in our country, her dream was to one day serve in the White House, and she had the rare opportunity to do just that, not only under the Bush administration, but also to remain in the White House when Bill Clinton took office in 1993. Tripp became embroiled in the Clinton impeachment hearings for turning over evidence of perjury to then-independent counsel Kenneth Starr. As a result of her cooperation, Tripp was personally attacked by government officials, the media, and many special interest groups, and the nature of her involvement in the Clinton scandal was gravely mischaracterized. I want to say that I personally consider this to be a shameful chapter in American journalism. Tripp was subsequently transferred from the White House to the Pentagon Public Affairs Office, where she served until the end of the Clinton administration. Today, Ms. Tripp lives just outside a small town in northern Virginia, where she's rightfully happy to be out of the spotlight. And while still besieged with requests for interviews from all of the top news programs in the nation, she has agreed to speak publicly for the first time in many years about current controversies surrounding the White House from the perspective perspective of a staffer and a concerned private citizen. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program a whistleblower and long-standing civil servant, Miss Linda Tripp. Thank you for joining us today, Miss Tripp. Thank you for inviting me, Rebecca. Now, I just want to say that there is no one in the country who would blame you from shutting the door on the press based on how you were treated during the Clinton impeachment. So I want to open the program today by asking you, why come forward now? Gosh, Rebecca, it's a compelling time in our country, whether it's what has gone on at the Department of Justice with the Attorney General possibly perjuring himself with the IRS overreach and frightening implications, the NSA leak, Benghazi. And let's not forget sequestration. We are in the middle of severe budget cuts that take away much-needed personnel. Just as an example, Walter Reed Medical Center, the first stop for wounded warriors, these personnel are no longer supporting Walter Reed Medical Center, but President Obama can jump with with a cast of hundreds to Africa. Uh, I just find it to be a compelling time. So you you sound like there is so much going on, and from your perspective, it's worrisome. Well, I think, look, obviously it's been 15 years since my involvement uh, with anything on the national stage. Um, My decision was to remain private. I certainly did not want to put my family through um, the trauma and the heartache of the kinds of attacks they endured during the Clinton debacle. But I have to say, despite all the media requests over the years, um, and it was everything from Oprah on her new network to the BBC and everything in between, Mm -hmm. um, I've declined all of them because they weren't substantive. They had nothing new to talk about. 
Yeah, they want to just dig up old news. And, you know, who cares about that, really? Um, you're, you've moved past that. I mean, you're living a very peaceful life. Uh, you're out of the spotlight. Uh, you're still very much uh, up to date on current events. But uh, speaking of your family, how do they feel about your decision to come forward again? Well, I think they've had sort of a mixed feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, They're extremely protective. They wanted so, so desperately to protect me during the time of the personal attacks, just as an example. And they were kids. They were kids in college. This was not something they were prepared to handle. So they wonder why I would risk the hatred, the vitriol, the, the, the sort of exposing of myself to those haters. But, yes, the intimidation tactics of the media establishment and political pundits and apologists was effective. It did silence me because there's really no way to describe what it's like to experience that sort of targeted character assassination. But there is one thing I know about you and your background, and that is that you come from a family where giving back to your country and community was one of the values that you were raised with. Your your dad was a civil defense director during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I believe your mom served on the Board of Education. And so this was one of the driving forces which motivated you to serve in the White House Um, And it was also one of the driving forces which compelled you to cooperate with the special counsel. So, you know, I can understand that that is a driving force for you to come forward now at a time when you think your country's in trouble. Yeah, I think I think the reality is that I've been out of step with the mainstream for some time. Uh, I'm a child of the 60s, yet I had no real understanding of flower power or psychedelic mind-altering drugs. (laughs) I was one of these kids who thought, wow, our guys are being sent to Vietnam. We have to support them. My boyfriend at the time was one. Later, my husband. I married as a first lieutenant. And to me, um, I guess I've always been pretty straight-laced, and my kids would tell you I'm really serious. Um, But, yeah, I mean, my background was such that we were taught from an early age Um, what duty, honor, country meant. And I believe it. It's part of who I am. And and I think that people have to understand that you had a reason not to trust the mainstream media. In fact, I know that uh, in an earlier conversation with you, I suggested that you should never, ever do an interview that's not live. Never let anybody tape you because you can't really trust the media anymore. I, I, and I'm in the media and I'm saying that. And it's, it's shameful that I have to make that admission. Yeah, I mean, the unfortunate part of... Uh, For instance, going up against the most popular president in history, as I as I did, is that you are then taking on not only the president's apologists, but also the liberal media establishment. And whether you believe it or not, it is a liberal media establishment. And so the slant is in, and the fix is in uh, before you've even attempted to have your say. Um, and you, you just have to know that. You just have to understand that that's what you're up against. And no person, no lay person, no government employee has the wherewithal to go up against the biggest PR machine, the, the most well-funded PR machine in the world, which is the White House. Well, that's certainly well said. Now, we have to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we're going to dive right into what happens to whistleblowers like uh, Tripp and Edward Edward Snowden, uh, Julian Assange, and uh, Private Manning. You're listening to the Costa Report.
This Legal Minute is brought to you by Nolan, Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Experienced attorneys providing professional legal services to the Central Coast for 85 years. Hello, this is attorney Stephen Wagner with your Legal Minute. Have you ever said to yourself, there ought to be a law for that? Well, often there is. In today's segment, I will address the issue of distracted driving, and here's my opening salvo. Smartphones make dumb drivers. Of course, I'm talking about all those other drivers. The laws vary from state to state, but there is one common thread. These laws were legislatively put on the books because of the outcry of concern over drivers who are texting, talking, emailing, and tweeting. Distracted driving is nothing new. We used to look at the cows and pastures. Now we take photos with our smartphones. In California, there are over 20 million licensed drivers. 20 million! Here's a scary thought. Just think about how many of those 20 million own and use cell or smartphones. I can't possibly cover all the laws in all the states, but I can say that the trend is to prohibit or sharply curtail some uses of smartphones while driving. Whether this leads to a new species of liability remains to be seen, but one thing is clear. With each new feature and amazing breakthrough in technology comes a new and tempting distraction. As new laws go into effect, it will be interesting to see how this impacts the law of negligence. I predict that these new laws will expand the application of important negligence concepts such as duty, breach, and causation, thereby creating more liability theories. While we marvel at the great advances in technology and the cool things that our smartphones can do, they just keep on getting smarter. But do we? This is Stephen Wagner, and that's your Legal Minute. Brought to you by Nolan, Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Selected in 2013 as one of the top law firms in the United States by Martindale Hubble. Yes, it is loud. It is raucous. It is fun. So get up and go for it. Take the family. Take the friends. Take the entire neighborhood to the rip roaring racing fun at Ocean Speedway in Watsonville. Ocean Speedway is taking the week off so you can enjoy a 4th of July holiday with your family and friends. So fire up and barbecue and celebrate living in the best nation the world has ever known and make plans for Friday the 12th when Ocean Speedway hosts the third annual Howard Kading Classic. Ocean Speedway is located at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds, just two miles east of downtown Watsonville on Highway 152. Get up and go for the loud, rockets, rip-roaring racing fun this Friday night at Ocean Speedway. Have you ever watched a group of motorcycles roar on by and wonder, who are those guys? Where are they going? Well, now you can eavesdrop in on their biker world right here on KSCO 1080. A half hour of biker news, clues, and interviews with me, Biker Bob, and some of the motorcycling world's interesting celebrities. Biker Bob Radio on KSCO 1080. Don't miss Biker Bob Radio every Sunday at 3.30 right here on AM 1080 KSCO. Remember, that Sunday at 3.30 on KSCO. Hey, Dad. How do you throw a curveball? How do you build a fort? How do refrigerators run? How do fish learn how to swim? Kids ask a lot of questions. How high can you jump? But you don't have to know every answer. How many phone numbers are there? Because you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. How do cell phones work? There are thousands of children in foster care who don't need every question answered. What's electricity? They just need you. What's the moon made of? For more information on how you can adopt, go to AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today served in the White House under the Bush and Clinton administrations. Miss Linda Tripp is with us. And uh, before the break, you were making the point that sometimes when you try to do the lawful and ethical thing, you might find yourself up against the most powerful PR machine in the world at the White House. Um, now, this didn't occur to me until I started doing research for today's program, um, but I wonder how much of what happened to you had to do with being a female who disclosed um, and collected information as opposed to looking at Daniel Ellsberg or Julian Assange, Edward Snowden. Do you think that uh, in some ways that that gave permission for people to make more personal attacks than you might see going on with other whistleblowers? No, Rebecca, I really don't. I, I believe that um, it was gender, gender neutral. Um, I think they used my 
appearance. And what's interesting is uh, when I look now and I look back at the pictures that were disseminated all over the world in 1998, I realized that those pictures were the result of years of my um, trauma, really, Mm -hmm. in watching how the Clintons operated and watching and knowing what I knew and not knowing how to share it. Um, So what did I do? I ate myself into oblivion, which is what a lot of people do under stress. I was probably the queen of that. Um, And I didn't even recognize myself in those pictures. Well, people under stress, you know, look what happens. Look at Obama's hair after just the first (laughs) term. Right. Uh, that happens to all presidents. They age in office. It's a, it's an unwieldy and completely un. Um, there is no way to understand the pressures of that job. That's true. Absolutely. Uh, now, one of the reasons that I I bring up the gender issue and also what happens really to whistleblowers is because um, we've talked about this, but. Uh, the United States had an opportunity to pave a pathway for whistleblowers to come forward without fear of retribution or breaking the law. Uh, um, in 2007, Henry Waxman introduced H.R. 985, which was known as the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. And this made it possible for folks like Snowden and Manning to come forward in a legitimate way. Is that right? Well, what is right is that H.R. 985 would have precluded our present-day situation with Snowden doing his international dance through countries that are unfriendly to us, and in the process, uh, indisputably sharing his documented evidence of our secrets with these countries. So, yes, that would have provided uh, protections and redress for the intelligence community as well, not just uh, federal employees. And look, there's a lot of discuss- discussion as to whether Ed- Edward Snowden is a hero or a villain. I'm not touching that. There's an ongoing investigation. However, if the government had established procedures under which intelligence employees could report wrongdoing and be protected from retaliation, Snowden would have had a path. But, and it would have been clear whether this was espionage intended to hurt the United States or not. I mean, in the absence of a path, what other choice do people have if they see wrongdoing? Well, it's interesting that what the intelligence agencies have uh, sort of all together put forth to uh, lobby Obama, who, who, by the way, had promised that these protections would be in place should he be elected. Um, But the reason he compromised, in fact, caved on those reassurances and protections for, among others, national security employees, um, is because the intelligence agency said, whoa, we'd have way too many whistleblowers. Well, what is wrong with that? I'd rather have a whistleblower come forward with evidence of malfeasance, illegal activity, fraud, waste, and abuse, and let them have a path through Congress and through ju- ju- uh, judicial redress where they would have the protection of the court instead of allowing our national secrets to reside in the hands of countries that are at best unfriendly to us. I mean, I'm sure China and Russia think it's way cool that we didn't provide these protections. I couldn't agree with you more. I I think if we had put a formal way for someone to be able to lodge these kinds of complaints and report wrongdoing, then you don't put people in a position where it's an uncontrolled release of information, which is exactly what's occurred. But what's interesting is, yes, in 2007, the House of Representatives voted overwhelmingly to support H.R. 985. What does that give us? It gave us the same due process protections available to all federal employees, and it included intelligence agency employees under the Civil Rights Act. It afforded them all the right to protection from retaliation for whistleblowing. And here's the the important thing, with full court access in federal court. And they were in this H.R. 985, 
They were given the right to obtain compensatory damages. So when your reputation is smeared and completely annihilated, you have a way to be heard in a court of law. And you have a way to receive compensatory damage so that when you can no longer get a job because you've been smeared by the administration, you have redress. And so, so what happened to H.R. 985, in your opinion? What, why, why was this shut down? Because we're paying the price for it now. Well, we are. And I wonder how they think it's going now. I wonder if they think, gee, hmm, not a good idea. I mean, President Obama in 2008, when he was candidate Obama, answered yes to a very important question, which was, should employees who expose weaknesses in homeland security um, and in the government's efforts to combat terrorism be fully protected under whistleblower law? He said yes. However, he did not support H.R. 985, which would have totally covered the Snowden mess. And, in fact, when my attorney, the National Whistleblower uh, Center's executive director, approached the White House in the form of a law partner, um, or I'm sorry, a law student cohort of Barack Obama's, and said, hey, wait, your, your guy promised this, and he's now president, he promised this in his campaign. Their answer was, yeah, well, we're not going to do it. So... Now they're reaping sort of the reward of what they chose not to support because we would not be in this amazingly dangerous situation. I think people don't understand the dangers. Um, Had Snowden had a path to go to Congress and to court. Instead, he's all over the map. Now China has our secrets. And let me tell you one other thing before you go on. Both China and Russia now have anything he documented and had with him. Without his knowledge, they have it. This is not a good thing. No, it it is not a good thing. And I I actually argue that it puts uh, many other intelligence uh, and military personnel at risk. And uh, yeah, there's no question about that. So uh, it is a very, very dangerous situation, as you point out. And I hope that uh, folks that are listening today will bother to Google H.R. 985 so that they can get the facts, because that's what we're all about here on the Costa Report is making sure the facts get out. Now, we have to take another break. When we come back, we're going to find out why Tripp is worried about the American Constitution. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. It's called Business Elite, and there's only one place you can find it on the Central Coast. Hello, I am Melvin Cooper. Business Elite here at Chevrolet of Watsonville means we do everything we need to do to get your business on the road and keep it on the road. And I am Monty Medeiros, manager of Business Elite Commercial Truck Department. With over 20 years of helping Central Coast businesses get the right truck for the right job, I am truly proud of Chevrolet of Watsonville's ability to keep your business rolling. Listen. Hi, this is Rory Odegaard from Watsonville. We recently purchased a 
the 2012 Traverse from Chevrolet of Watsonville. Just want to say we were treated very well by Monty and the rest down there. Very happy with the process. There was no pressure. They had a nice selection. We drove off 24 hours later in our new vehicle. Get your business on the road with the help of the Business Elite Commercial Truck Department here at Chevrolet of Watsonville. And keep your business on the road with special discount pricing on commercial trucks and maintenance. For details, call or click ChevroletofWatsonville.com. We appreciate you giving us an opportunity to earn your business. All right, everybody, listen up. Fightemingoddess.com. That's right. Fightemingoddess.com or Fightemingod.com. <laughs> what are you laughing at? What? You've heard me for years. Proclaim the advantages of getting all your essential supplements, vitamins, and minerals. But of course, where else? VitaminGoddess.com. You can remember that. VitaminGoddess.com. VitaminGoddess.com. Come on. Or VitaminGod.com. Why? Because it seems like everybody in their monkey's uncle is on the internet. So why not you? If you are, check it out. Go see a beautiful website and a beautiful way to get all your supplements. VitaminGoddess.com or VitaminGod.com. And remember, may you live long and prosper. Hey, what you doing? I'm online looking at a satellite view of the neighborhood. Huh. What's with all the dots? Green means it's for sale. Yellow means sold. Gotcha. Hey, is that the house we looked at? Yeah, I love it. Maybe we should talk to a realtor. Make an offer? Did that house just go from green to yellow? Yeah, sold. Right before our very eyes. Buyers are in the market, but there's a shortage of homes for sale. If you've been thinking about selling, now may be the right time. Every market's different. Call a Realtor today or visit Realtor.com. Realtors are members of the National Association of Realtors. Michael Olson's second law of the food chain. The farther we go from the source of our food, the less control we have over what's in our food. Now that so much of our food comes from thousands of miles away, we should all get together Saturday at 9 a.m. as the Food Chain Radio Show tracks down who is putting what in our food. If you have a comment about the second law of the food chain, tell me. Michael Olson, all about it at MetroFarm.com. Now, see you all on KSEO Saturday at 9 a.m. for some What's Eating Grunt Radio on the food chain. What day was that? Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Linda Tripp. So let's switch gears here for just a moment and talk about the uh, current scandal over IRS overreach. We now have reports that the head of the IRS was cleared to visit the White House 157 times. And some folks are calling this now the smoking gun. So here's my, here's my question. You worked in the West Wing under two presidents, a Republican and a Democratic uh, administration. So just how unusual is 157 visits? Can, can you put that in perspective for us? Well, look, I mean, first of all, when I worked in the West Wing of the White House in both uh, administrations, it was in the Oval Office corridor. Mm -hmm. So um, that is unusual on its face. Um, I can tell you that the principles of agencies are seldom, seldom uh, present at working group meetings, just as an example. Now, there have been conflicting reports as to what he was doing there and when and how often. The reality is that under Bush II, the IRS commissioner was at the West Wing of the White House once in four years. Once in four years. Correct. And that, (laughs) from my perspective, would be just about what you'd expect. The notion... President Obama put out a statement which boggled my mind, and that was that the IRS is an independent agency when he was confronted with these 157 visits, um, an independent agency, and he had nothing to do with them, essentially. Well, the reality is the IRS falls under the purview of the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department is headed by the Secretary of the Treasury, who is appointed by the president. So none of this makes any sense. There is absolutely no reason for the IRS commissioner to be at the White House Easter egg roll, notwithstanding, that many times. 
But you're talking about the head of the IRS going to see Bush once in four years versus 157 visits. I just want people to get perspective. That's what this show's all about, getting information the mainstream inf- mainstream media is not getting out there. Th- that's just too extreme. Wouldn't, wouldn't that raise a red flag? It should. <laughs> okay. It should. So and what about know, this idea of these rogue agents that are reporting to the president, that they just kind of go off the reservation and do what needs to be done and the president is oblivious to it? Is that a real, is that a real scenario in the, in the White House? Look, the notion that, and again, maybe you have to have the perspective um, of years of government service of the highest levels, but I can tell you this. There is no way on God's green earth that agents, rogue or otherwise, in an Ohio satellite office decided that they would take on, autonomously and independently, take on a political hot potato like political enemies of the current administration. The notion is ludicrous on its face. They didn't. I can promise you that. And everything they do is by directive. Everything. See, this is why I think it's so important for people to talk to you, because you worked under Republican and a Democratic administration right there in the Oval Office corridor. You know what is normal and what is not, what is unusual, what ought to raise a red flag. I mean, who can speak to this uh, better than you? Well, look, I mean, I think what what is missing in this equation is that I was a career White House staffer, which means when you are sworn in and you take the oath of office, you understand, and if you don't understand, they make it quite clear so that you have to understand that your allegiance, your loyalty is to the institution of the presidency, not to any individual. And I took that to heart. That was my mantra. That was my guidance to the institution of the presidency. And, yeah, I'm seeing these things, and I'm mind-boggled. And I'm mind-boggled that the citizenry is forced to swallow this claptrap that that they're being fed. Now, you've expressed a number of concerns about the lack of accountability, and I think that's a big word, right? Because, frankly, uh, we've talked about the IRS and we've talked about Snowden and the NSA, uh, but now uh, we also believe that we there was just a deliberate campaign of misinformation regarding Benghazi, and we haven't even gotten the full story there. So let me ask you again, based on your experience under two administrations, how unusual is it for the president to be out of touch with the situation room? Well, it it doesn't happen. I mean, it just plain does not happen. And the Benghazi bothers me the most. I mean, I can cite you chapter and verse of how whistleblowers were protected from 1777 on. But I don't know that anyone wants to hear that. I will tell you that Benghazi has me absolutely beside myself. So what is it about that case that you find disturbing? Well, look, we're, we're talking about career diplomats here. We're not talking about political appointees who may or may not have any legitimate experience in their field. These are people who have come up through the ranks, they've earned their stripes, they are loyal to the United States, and they've proven that they are worthwhile employees of the United States. I want to know why basic security protocols were not administered in Benghazi. Security protocol demands that all ambassadors, all, be accompanied by a security detail at all times. When you're talking of a country such as Libya, with such a high threat risk, yes. why was there no armed security detail with him in Benghazi? And, but that hasn't been answered. None of this has been answered. It's the move-on mentality. Back in the Clinton administration, it was the same thing. We inoculate the public with a gazillion scandals, 
until they're numb, and we move on. We move on, and there's no accountability, and there's no consequence. But there are a couple things here that are critical. I mean, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, any Secretary of State is accompanied 24-7 by uh, a rather large contingent of security personnel. Uh That means that she is accompanied when she leaves the State Department. She is accompanied by a chase car, and she is in an armored van. They're all equipped with Uzis. There is protection without end. Uh, Ambassadors as personal representatives of the president are afforded the same security, but he had none. And by the way, what was so important that the ambassador had to personally go to Benghazi from Tripoli, where his post was, without an armed security detail, to establish what Hillary Clinton determined was justification to make Benghazi a permanent outpost. I didn't understand the urgency of establishing Benghazi as a permanent outpost. Was there a particular deadline there? Well, apparently the end of the fiscal year, which is always the end of September, and in that year it was 2012, um, would have fiscally allowed her to post that that location in a full permanent way. And I I guess, I don't know, but I guess that she wanted him to do it personally. That doesn't happen. An ambassador doesn't do the get down in the weeds kind of work. He would have sent someone, but be that as it may, he went. But he was not accompanied by his absolute critical and must be present at all times security. And then so there's a cut. Yeah, there's a couple of things here. It's the fact that it was the end of the fiscal year. The fact that they were trying to establish the outpost as a permanent outpost in Benghazi. The fact that the ambassador left Tripoli. You know, there's a lot of questions here, and I just don't even hear our government officials asking those questions. So I'm very appreciative that you're here to point that out. Now we have to take our last break, and we'll be back right after this brief message from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. Now, everyone knows that my favorite is your Pinot Noir, but Caraccioli's known for a lot more than that. It's really the bubbles that kind of differentiates what we're doing in the area as opposed to a lot of our peers. And the way that we looked at it was there's great Chardonnay and Pinot Noir fruit in the Santa Lucia Highlands in the greater Monterey County. And we wanted to be able to utilize those grapes and showcase them in a little bit different light. And to do that comes a little bit of a laborious process in terms of making sparkling wine and doing A little it. bit? A lot of bit, <laughs> but still definitely worth the trouble and worth the wait. Um, we're currently selling 2006 and 2007 sparkling wines in the beginning of 2013. So it kind of tells you the time invested as well as all of the different techniques that we use and Michelle implements to ensure that we're delivering a quality product. Thank you for being with us again, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. What does your website do for you? Does it simplify doing business and automate routine tasks? Does it connect with your target audience and bring new business? If you can't answer yes, then you need to contact Sunstar Media. Located on the Monterey Peninsula for over 17 years, Sunstar Media has developed websites for startups, brick-and-mortar stores, to corporations on the stock market. What makes Sunstar different is the customization that goes into every site, tailored to each client's unique needs and vision. Sunstar's experienced pros keep you ahead of the game with their custom-fit development process for website applications that cater to your company's specific needs. Learn more at sunstarmedia.com. Mention you heard this ad on the Rebecca Costa show and get a free web analysis report on your current site or a free web consultation for your next project. Let's discuss how Sunstar can help you. Reach out to us at sunstarmedia.com. Hello, my name is John Lundgren. I've been managing and selling income property in Santa Cruz County for the past 25 years. Do you have residential or light commercial rental property in the Santa Cruz area? 
Would you like to take the worries and pressures of managing your property off of your shoulders and place those concerns onto my shoulders? Well, I'm ready. I'm a licensed California real estate agent with Karen Properties at your service from the Harbor Lights to Summit Road, Moss Landing to Davenport, and all that's in between. Please call anytime. Weekends and evenings are fine. John Lundgren, area 831-475-RENT. That's 831-475-7368. Where the sun hits the water and the mountains meet the sand, there's a beach that I walk along sometimes. Severino's Bar and Grill in Aptos is always busting with excitement. You'll get a family atmosphere, casual dining in or outdoor on the patio next to the koi pond and waterfall. Tasty salads, appetizers, and affordable entrees. Happy hour every day from 3 to 6. If it's live music you enjoy, they have it Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. Sports? Watch the games on the five flat screens. Severino's Bar and Grill is a great place to meet friends and family. Severino's Bar and Grill, inside the Sea Cliff Inn on Highway 1 in Aptos. Sea Cliff Eat, Drink, Explore Radio is your lifestyle information source. Our focus includes food, wine, craft beer, travel and tourism trends, emphasizing healthy, local, and sustainable options. We've got you covered from 8 to 10 each and every Sunday morning, live, right here on KSEO AM 1080. Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, your source for the lifestyle you love. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Linda Tripp. And before the break, you were talking about the fact that there are many questions that are still unanswered regarding Benghazi, not the least of which is why the normal levels of security were not present for our ambassador there. Now, I have one more question about Benghazi, which you could shed some light on, and that is that increasingly it looks like Hillary Clinton, who was heading up the State Department at that time, uh, she seems to be taking the fall for this. And so many people have been predicting that, you know, she will be the Democratic candidate uh, following Barack Obama's second term. Uh, So I'm just trying to reconcile those two stories. Why would she take the fall for Benghazi if she's being set up to uh, to be the nominee in the next presidential election? I thought you might have some insight on that. Well, let's not forget, she bumped her head so she wasn't able to... um adequately sort of support her position as it regards Benghazi. But but let me ask you this question. Mm-hmm. Who in their right mind would deny repeated requests for extra security from an ambassador in a high-risk country? But she did. Look, security is a priority with the State Department. I mean, budgetary restraints are not an issue. The diplomatic security has its own separate budget, which is outside of the State Department's annual budget. It's provided by Congress, and it's very generous. So under what circumstance can you imagine? I'm I'm not saying that you know this factually. I'm just saying that under what circumstance would you get repeated requests for security and be denied? What, what, What is a scenario that that would happen? Well, look. I mean, what, what drives this country, regrettably? Political expediency. And this was, when did this happen? Seven weeks before a national election for president? I mean, this was critical that it be anything but terrorism related. So we, we wanted to basically say we've got terrorism under control and we were hoping that this wouldn't turn out the way that it did. Is is that what ran, we're saying? He he ran on having cut off the head of the the terrorist sort of movement with the killing of Os- Osama bin Laden. So you can't so say that, on the one hand you've you've cut off the head of the Hydra and there and no other heads appeared. You can't say that and at the same time have your embassy uh, require additional security because people are going to come in and kill. Uh, American personnel. You can't have both those stories out there. Look, I think what we miss in this country is that these are these were living, breathing people with mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, kids, and they 
the very least they should have been able to expect was protection from that their own government provided in a high risk area. And they didn't get that. They didn't get that on any level. I mean, in fact, as I understand it, and fact checkers can check, it appears that the CIA outpost, which was within close proximity, was told to stand down when they wanted to um, essentially save the ambassador from certain death. Two went in, and they were killed. Mm -hmm. So so I think I think the story, should anyone care to actually look into it and instead of this move on mentality and let's get to something else, is that something smells to high heaven. The entire State Department knew that. They knew that. Well, but having no lived in Laos that. during the Vietnam War, uh, I lived in an embassy compound. And I can tell you that uh, there's nowhere on earth I could have felt more secure. We were completely surrounded by military protection. And uh, and that wasn't even a violent situation. We were out long before the path at Lao came into Vinchin. But, uh, you know, I, I felt very secure and I never worried about it, which which is one of the reasons why I relate so well to what you're saying about there not being the normal levels of protection that any embassy would uh, enjoy, particularly in a uh, in a hostile area. So so this well, program is, isn't just concerned with trying to get to the bottom of these kinds of problems, but also about solutions. And I know that there are a lot of listeners today who are surprised to discover that they share some of the same concerns um, uh, that you do, uh, that the that many things, uh, many constitutional rights are under attack, and and um, and so I, again, I'd like to draw on your experience working in the Pentagon with black ops, and then under a Republican and Democratic administration in the West Wing of the White House. I mean, how do we get back on track? Well, gosh, I mean, you know, accountability. I mean, I believe that accountability is first and foremost because with accountability comes consequences. But we don't have that anymore. What we have is slaying the messenger who should dare come forward with anything that isn't remotely sort of on the party plan. And I go back to Benghazi. You said yourself in Laos you felt protected. Very safe. Right, but but the. I mean, my father felt safe enough to take his kids and wife to live there. Right, it doesn't get any safer than that. In each embassy, in each consulate, or any American presence post overseas, there is a published emer- emergency action plan. Yes, it contains all the security procedures for use within that country, and yet, I mean, look at what happened here. I mean, this is coordinated with the military. There is a way out for these people. Absolutely. In Laos, when the path at Lao invaded Vinchin, which is the capital of Laos, we were choppered over the Mekong River safely into Thailand. That was the emergency evacuation. Every embassy has one, and it went off like clockwork. Exactly, and that's my point. But, you know, no one is raising these questions because we've moved on to the next scandal or the George Zimmerman trial or all these things. We we are in a move-on mentality, which means that in the end, there is really no accountability. But you know what? Dead is dead. These people are dead. They were entitled to the utmost protection from their country and the service of their country. They didn't get it. And the question should be, why didn't they get it? Why are they dead? So do you think this is a problem where we just don't have oversight anymore? I just think that we are not allowed to question the powers that be as to why something like this could be allowed to happen. Instead, there are talking points which change dramatically. Yeah. Change dramatically. And what does the American citizenry citizenry get? I mean, the people get that this is how it went down. We did our best. It was fluid. We hear constantly it was fluid. Well, of course, in real time, it was fluid. The The State Department has real time eyes on every situation in the world. That information is immediately immediately there is no no second that goes by that the white house situation room is not also 
uh, cognizant of what is going on, which means the president immediately, no time at all that he is out of the loop. So my question would be, how on earth did you allow these people to die? How? Well, on that note, unfortunately, we are out of time, but uh, I have to say uh, I'm going to get a lot of emails about this interview. I I know this already because uh, you have been so forthcoming and so outspoken. outspoken. And uh, so before we let you go, I do want to take a moment to thank you for agreeing to speak with us today. Thank you so much, Ms. Tripp. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Rebecca. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you'd like to comment on today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're pretty much everywhere on the net and easy to find. And if you missed this full interview with Linda Tripp today, you can download the program from our website, Apple iTunes and Podbean, as well as our new YouTube channel. And I do hope you'll take a moment to link this important interview to your friends. And one small programming note, the week of July 19th, I'll I'll be broadcasting live from the G20 Summit in London, where I have been invited to speak at the summit and also the House of Lords at the British Parliament. We'll be interviewing two finance ministers from directly from the BBC in London. So you don't want to miss what they have to say about global predatory economic practices, something we should all be very concerned about. My guest next week is outspoken former congressman from Massachusetts and one of our country's most prominent gay public figures, Mr. Barney Frank. He'll be with us to talk about the Supreme Court's ruling on the Defense of Marriage Act and how the Obama presidency is really doing in its second term. Don't miss Barney Frank in a candid conversation right here on the Costa Report, the one program you can count on week after week to put principles ahead of partisan politics. Now stay tuned for the second hour of the Costa Report when we hear what you have to say. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Why does the United States spend the largest percentage of GDP in the world on health care? Why do we have the highest cancer rates on the planet, the highest rates of diabetes, autism, and every other major disease? It all comes down to one thing. We are what we eat. Our food is devoid of nutrition and processed with poisons and additives. Our water is filled with toxic poisons and big pharma runoff. We can turn the tide against those who seek to profit by making and keeping us unhealthy by giving ourselves the nutrients our bodies desperately need. To learn more, go to kscohealth.com. The site is literally packed with audio and video featuring top health professionals who don't bow down to big pharma. The fight against servitude starts with you, and you can't stand against the machine if you are sick, tired, and obese. When you visit kscohealth.com, be sure to check out the catalog with nearly 400 life-changing products, and get free shipping when you sign up for auto ship from san jose to salinas red hot news talk am 1080 ksco santa cruz